So th- why is this talk so important? Present Future Church, this is the idea, the church that I want to give away to my kids. What kind of church are we creating together as a, as a community um, that will empower the next generation to walk without having to heal from their experience of church? I can't tell you how many conversations I continue to have every single week about the pain that people have from the church. And I think one of my missions in life now is to... Uh, create a church that looks as good and beautiful as Jesus and that's our hope Um, and that's hard because it's messy um, because we're imperfect and we're broken people but that's what we're after so we've talked about all sorts of topics you can go through and listen to the podcast or YouTube but today I want to talk about the thing that matters most as our church and and I feel like um, this talk in particular is why the garden church exists Um, It is what I continue to try to train our staff and our elders and our leaders to understand. It's when we gather as elders this this last Wednesday night, the the whole time we we, we are together, um, we are asking this question, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? And I think this particular topic is the most important for us as business owners, as students, as teachers, as moms, as dads, as single, as married people, as divorced people, as, as uh, uh, empty nesters. It, it literally is for every person. It's for children, it's for the two-year-olds, and it's for the 85-year-olds in our church. This particular topic, because this has to do with what it means to be a disciple. If I could train, this is what I've realized, if I could train every follower of Jesus on this subject, and if they could get it, we would see a movement of God. That's what I believe. So uh, if you have a Bible, I want to go to Matthew chapter 7. It's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus ends his talk, um, the Sermon on the Mount, which is kind of Matthew's consolidation of his teachings, of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom. Um, And he ends it with this, verse 24 of chapter 7. It says this, Therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." This is how the Sermon on the Mount ends. And then Jesus goes and he heals a man with leprosy. So what Jesus is essentially saying and what it, the secret to becoming a follower of Jesus, the secret of living a life in the kingdom of God is to be someone who learns to hear God's voice and obeys. It's that simple. The one thing I want you to learn as a disciple of Jesus is how to hear his voice and obey his voice words. If you want any of these um, notes that are going to be on here, they're on the app. So if you download, if you just have, open up the app, it says uh, Hearing God, and all these slides will be available if you can't read these, because there's a bunch of slides. So what I want to talk about today is the fact that God desires to speak to you, that God, I want to, I want to talk about um, what it means to hear God's voice. How do we hear God's voice? How does God speak, and how can we grow as people hearing God's voice? Does that sound good to you? I'm gonna do it either way. So I'm happy to disappoint. But this is what we're gonna talk about today. So isn't it fascinating that God desires to speak to you, that the author of life, the creator of the universe, the God who has revealed himself in creation, in history, through scripture, through Jesus of Nazareth, desires to speak to you, not like you general, like you as an individual. Me, Darren, rounds in. He desires to speak. And I guess the question, and and this is what I've learned, it's not that God um, just desires to speak. The the truth is he's always speaking. The question then is, are we listening to God? Are we listening? And I want to even go further down that question and just ask this question, what does it mean to hear? Now stay with me because this doesn't necessarily make sense with English because when I'm, what I'm gonna talk about today, this idea of hearing and obeying is deeply rooted in scripture. And we'll get to the practicals of how God speaks and then we'll get to the practicals of how we can grow in just a moment. But I wanna go through some scripture. So if you have a Bible, go to Deuteronomy chapter six. And I wanna talk about what it means to hear. 
What it means to hear, what is it? So if God's speaking all the time, are we listening? What does it mean to hear? Now check this out. So Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, there's this, um, there's what is called the Shema prayer. Now every Jewish boy and girl learned this prayer. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4. It's the beginning of the greatest commandment that Jesus uh, re- talks about in all of the gospels. Um, but it says this, and I want you to read this in your scripture or in your, in your Bible app. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And it keeps going. But this is called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, this Shema was like the pledge of allegiance to the first century Jew. So by the time Jesus is around, every morning he woke up, he would say the Shema. Every time he would walk into the temple or every time he would walk into a synagogue, they would say the Shema. The Shema was like the, the, um, the, the mission statement of the law. When you woke up and said, hear, O Israel, Shema, you were essentially saying, I believe in all of the commands of God. The 613 commands found in the Torah. It it was a declaration of dependence and allegiance to the law, to being a, a follower of Yahweh, to being the people of God. Now the Hebrew word for Shema means to hear. That's what it says right here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, hear. Now, there are less words in the Hebrew uh, language than there are in the English language. And so words have greater meaning and significance. Now, it says it means hear, but I want to go to Exodus because I want you to see this, this word found in Exodus chapter 24. So Exodus 24, verse 7, we have another passage of Scripture. It says this, um, Then he, Moses, took the book of the covenant and read it to the people, they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Stay right there for me, Marvin. We will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Now, Shema is translated in Deuteronomy 6, 4 as hear. And Shema is found in Exodus 24, verse 7, and it's translated in this case, obey. Go to the next slide, Marvin. So in the Hebrew language, The English word obey uh, is translated from the Hebrew word shema. So go to the next slide. So in the Hebrew language, shema means to hear and it also means to obey. Now all of you parents should be saying amen. (laughs) Ezra, did you hear me? What am I saying? Did you obey me? Think about it. Now just play with this for a second because this, this has to do with the difference between the Greek mindset or the Western mindset, which we are a part of, and the difference between the Hebrew mindset. In the Greek and Western thought, to hear is mental activity. It's like about our ears hearing the sound waves. Someone talks and we hear them. We hear the noise they're making, the sound waves. But in Hebrew, to hear means to allow the words to sink in provide understanding and generate a response. In other words, hearing and doing are basically the same thing. Now this is so essential to understanding the heart of what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter seven. James chapter one talks about being not just hearers of the word but doers of the word. Thank you, those of you that are reading scripture. There's this, all this debate, well, it's dead works. You know, we gotta just have faith. Faith in the Hebrew and first century concept had, was, was about aligning your life, walking, standing, acting out in the reality of what you believe, not some empty philosophical idea that's lifeless. It's about restructuring your very existence around the things that you have come to know here and here and here. And so there's no difference. This is why it's so essential as disciples for us to understand and learn how to hear his voice and obey. Check out this passage from Luke. So it's not just in Matthew. Luke says this um, in Luke chapter eight, verse five. This is one of the most famous parables. And this is Jesus talking about what it means, what the kingdom of God is like, what what it's like to be a disciple. And I'll talk about it for a second. But he says this, a farmer went out to sow his seed. 
As he was scattering his seed, some fell along the path and it was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Whoever has ears to hear, he's not just saying, oh, anyone that can hear this, let them hear it. He's saying, what is he saying? It's a very Hebrew idea. Whoever has ears to hear, let them obey. Let them understand, let them experience. Let the words get inside the soul, permeate so that you may respond. We want to talk about it like I just got to understand the facts about this parable. He's saying, no, this parable will be di- digested inside of you. You're going to eat this parable and it's going to do stuff into your soul. And what is the, the parable itself? Well, in the kingdom of God, anytime a word is spoken, a truth is spoken by a pastor or a preacher, anytime you're living life, you're, you are any kind of these soils at any given time. It's not just you're always one soil. Anytime the kingdom of God is preached, anytime the word is preached, you will be like any of these soils. Sometimes you'll, it will just fall on, on the path and it will just be done away with. It'll get trampled on. Other times, birds will eat it up. Other times, it will get choked out. But some, 25% of you, at any given moment, will produce such an exponentially type of harvest, it doesn't make sense to farmers because no one sows and gets a hundredfold return. But that's what it's like in the kingdom. That's what happens when you actually hear. Do you get what I'm saying? Amen. That's what it's like to hear and obey as disciples. All sorts of statistics coming out, by the way. This is just off the cuff. I wanna let you know. There's a book called Faith for Exiles that's come out by David Kinnaman. And it's all this Barna research came out looking at the Gen Z, the generation that's coming after the millennials. The millennials are the least church generation in the West in history. They're saying Gen Z is even worse. And they estimate that in any given church on any given Sunday, 20% of the attendants in church are actual disciples. So if you look at our congregation, 20% of you are actually disciples. This is what they're discovering. And what they mean by that is that you experience Jesus, you're practicing your faith, the scriptures come alive and you're reading the scriptures, you're generous, you're giving, you're participating in community, you're doing the things that scripture says, but 80% of the church in the West today are habitual churchgoers. They just go to church out of habit. And that's true to this parable. Interesting, right? I'll just let that sit. What does all this mean? What does all this mean? Well, the essential goal to following Jesus is learning to hear his voice and obey. That's the essence of discipleship is that we have learned to hear his voice and obey. Next slide. So how does God speak and how can we grow in hearing his voice? How do we grow in hearing God's voice? Does anyone want that question answered? All right, let's go through these, these um, things together. So how does God speak? I wanna give you 10 ways that we see God speaks. Now, this is um, pretty exhaustive, but I wanna give you like 10, 10 ways God speaks. Ready? Number one is through Jesus. It's clear that Je- Jesus is how God speaks. God speaks through Jesus. It says in John 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, Logos, was, is God. God speaks through Jesus. Hebrews chapter one says this, in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Can I get an amen about Jesus? God speaks through Jesus. Number two, God speaks through the scripture. Our scriptures, I, I love it. This is what's so funny to me. Anytime people come to our church and like, I just don't know, I, I don't hear God's voice. I'm like, have you read scripture in a while? Because he's always speaking through the scripture. This is his word. He spoke to us. People saw that they needed to write down the things that were going on. And over a series of hundreds of years, it, they canonized this Old and New Testament um, with, with the type of integrity that you can't even imagine in our day and age with leaders. But this 
has all sorts of amazing context, um, amazing words from the Lord, and God's always speaking. In, in 2 Timothy, it says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if you wanna hear God's voice, you should be immersed in the scriptures, amen? Number three, how does God speak? God speaks through creation. We see that in Romans chapter one when Paul is writing his great thesis to the Roman church. He says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. I mean, if you've ever watched a sunset and some people are just like, oh, this is just science, but I mean, have you ever seen a child get born? Have you ever, that's not, that's not creation, but that is creation. Um, have you ever been like, exhausted, burnt out, needing, um, uh, you've been distracted by the work and stress and you just go off into the woods or go off to the beach and just realize like you just recentered. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Like when, you, like when your soul's longing for rest, we wanna escape to the woods, to the forest or to the Grand Canyon or to some great space. Like I, I text my friend, I'm like, I need to go camping right now. Like I just preached on this health and then all week it was like this reminder of struggle, of burden and frustration and emotional weight. I was, I, I was reading the stats of the pastors last week and it hit me like, man, I still feel these things. As much as I've done all this work and what do I need to do? I need to go and retreat and be with God in nature. That's what I need right now. Some of you need that. You need to go camp and reconnect with the creation that God, his invisible qualities are just manifesting through the redwood trees and through sunsets and through um, perfect barrels. <laughs> More barrels, Lord. Four is through prophecy. Follow the, bless this sir, follow the way of love and eager, this is from 1 Corinthians, prophecy, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the uh, gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. Verse three says, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So God throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, and then with the giving of his Holy Spirit to the local church, he empowers his word, the word of the Lord in the moment for people for the purpose of building up the church. Prophecy is not some mystical thing, thus saith the Lord in King Jameth. <laughs> it's not that, it is uh, the people of God learning to listen on behalf of others and speak the words of God to strengthen, comfort, and encourage brothers and sisters together. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have seen the prophetic words be used in our church. It's insane, like, what God can do with someone who learns how to tune their ear to the Spirit in the moment and speak gentle words, words of knowledge, prophecy, and what that can do for people. And the outcome is always strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. If someone comes up to you, this is just a quick correction, and brings like this condemnation, it's not a prophetic word. Do you know that? Because you gotta, you gotta put it through the litmus test. Is this a prophetic word from God? Well, does it strengthen the person, encourage the person, and comfort them? No, it convicts them. That's not a prophetic word for you to give. Just side note. Stop doing it. A lot of pain that people have from the charismatic churches, which we are a charismatic church, some of you are like, we are? Yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> we practice the spiritual gifts, charismatic. Uh, but a lot of pain comes from the abuse of the spiritual gifts. All right, next slide. How does God speak? Dreams and visions. This, these are natural ways God speaks to us. Some of you think dreams and visions are supernatural ways. They're not, they're natural ways. Because if you close your eyes and use your imagination, that's just natural, Right? Sometimes it fuses in. So there's a passage in Acts 10 um, where I'll just skip to it. It says, uh, verse nine, just a brief moment where Peter is on top of this uh, house praying. It says, about noon following the following day as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. That's pretty much me all the time. I love Peter for this moment. It's in scripture. So he's hangry. And look at what happens. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance or vision. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down uh, to earth by its four corners. And then he describes all these animals and God says, eat. Is that what you want? Like, so what happens in this particular dream is he, he's having this dream, he's hungry, he's praying. God gives him this vision 
The vision is all these animals that are marked as unclean by the Old Testament. And he's a good Jewish boy who's never eaten these things. And it says it three times and he finally realized God's speaking something to him. And then he goes downstairs and Cornelius sends some messengers. This Gentile says, come into my house. A Jew would never go to a Gentile's house and eat unless they have a vision from the Lord saying, be prepared for what's about to come. And so out of obedience from a vision we are all here as Christians. Now just think about that for a moment. Because of Peter and Paul and the mission to the Gentiles, which we are all Gentiles, most of us, we're not Jewish. We are part of the kingdom, grafted in because of visions and dreams. Is that not amazing? Paul had a dream that a Macedonian man was saying, hey, come to Macedonia. And he couldn't get into these other places and so he's like, I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to Macedonia. I've had dreams. The reason Pastor Bill Doctrine is in our church, other than God speaking to him, is I had a dream in February before we started our church when I was in London that I asked him to come and speak. And so in August, six months later, I asked him to speak and I said, just preach for a couple months. It's been 10 years. Thank you, Jesus. (laughs) I also, I shared the story of giving up alcohol. It took me 15 months to obey a dream God gave me in January of 2015 and I finally said yes in March 2016. Some of us don't realize it, but God's speaking to us in dreams and visions. Go to the next one. We got 10, so, oh, we're doing good on time. God speaks through angels. Some of you are like, I want an angelic visitation. (laughs) I've been asking for that. But then I'm like, I think I might be a little too frightened. I don't do well with scary movies. I don't do well with like giant things in general. Um, but it, it's like I get overwhelmed easily. But this, I love this story. Okay, so I just want to put it up because I want you, some of you are like, I want to know it's God. I want an angel to come. So check this out. This is Zechariah, okay? So this is before John the Baptist was born and before Jesus. It says this, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, don't be afraid. And he says, hey, you're gonna, your wife's gonna get pregnant in her old age and you're gonna give birth to John the Baptist. And then he replies, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. My wife's old, (laughs) not sure how that works anymore. Think about it, he's at the temple at a holy moment of sacrifice when he is a priest who is sacrificing at the altar of incense and then Zechariah sees us, an angel, the angel says the long awaited Messiah is coming but the messenger that prepares the way that's promised is gonna be your son and your wife's gonna give birth and he's like hold on wait a second, is this really from God? I'm gonna throw out a couple of fleeces, like Gideon, you know what I'm saying? Like I just, is, is, so even if you have an angelic visitation, you might be confused. Can I get an amen? What is the, what does all this mean? It's hard to discern God's voice. Even when you're talking to an angel at the temple doing sacrifice. You know what's funny is Zechariah couldn't see past his circumstances. Side note. Audible voice. God speaks to uh, audibly. I, I've never heard the audible voice of God, but I want it. I've heard of people that have, and it, he's, you know, the burning bush, it says, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, this is Moses, God called to Moses from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. Just take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. All throughout scripture, God speaks audibly. Throughout history, God has spoken audibly to people. There's accounts of this. Go to the next one. Um, these are the ways most of us hear circumstances. So most of us think we hear God through circumstances. What do we call them? Open doors, right? Is this not the way most, like we, we have been trained to look at our circumstances and try to discern ways God is speaking to us through open or closed doors. Sometimes God has opened the door. Sometimes it's a temptation. 
Sometimes God closes the door. Sometimes you need to knock the door down to get to God's promise. Do you know what I'm talking about? He says, ask, seek, and knock. So sometimes the closed door is not from God. It's an opposition, and you need to bust that thing open, but circumstances are hard to discern. He speaks through circumstances. He speaks, number nine, through <clears throat> gut feeling and sense. This, and I just want to say, this is how most of my words of knowledge that I have for people, they come from gut feelings or senses. I don't see images. Some people see images when they pray for people. Some people hear like words spoken to them. I have sense, and I love what John Mumford taught a few months ago about what it's like to hear God's voice. And he said, in those moments where you're praying for other people, it's sometimes it's like a butterfly that comes and just gently taps your shoulder, and then it just flutters away. That's kind of what it's like to learn to operate in the supernatural discerning of words of knowledge and gifts of prophecy, um, at words of wisdom for people, both within the church and outside, because those gifts can be used outside of the church. I was driving in an Uber and I had a sense about this Uber driver's sick wife. And I just said, hey, I was, can I pray? Do you have a wife who's seriously sick that's altered your life? He couldn't believe it. How would you know this? She has a mental illness that came about after our son was born, and it's been 18 years. Our son's 18. I said, I didn't know it. Jesus knew it. I remember praying for a woman at uh, the laundry mat when we did laundry love on Pine and Eighth, and I was we, as we were praying, I had this sense that she had been abused. And how, how do you say that? But my sense was that nobody believed her, and it impacted her entire life. So I said to her, as we were praying, she was an atheist, I just feel like something happened to you when you were young, and it affected your whole life, and nobody believed. And she just started crying. How could you know this? And I love it. God gives me the words in the moment. I didn't know it. Jesus knows it, and he wants to know you. And she gave her life to Jesus. That's the power of learning to hear God's voice and obeying. That's why I believe it can create a movement. How many... How many moves of God are in this room? How many of us are waiting? God is just like waiting for us to finally under, hear and obey. Next one is um, the one I want to speak about a little bit more in length is directly into your heart and mind. God speaks directly into your heart and mind. This is the primary way God speaks to us. Dallas Willard says this. It's about this still small voice. The still small voice, it's that quiet whisper within your mind. The still small vo voice or the interior or inner voice, as it is also called, is the preferred and most valuable form of individualized communication for God's purposes. God usually addresses individually those who walk with him in a mature personal relationship using this inner voice, proclaiming the, and showing forth the reality of the kingdom of God as they go. So what, what it means to be a disciple who's mature in their faith is we don't need the circumstances as often. We don't need the angelical visitations. We don't need the audible voices. What we learn is how to walk with God always. I, I was running yesterday, and it's been, I haven't been able to run a lot. I got sick, and I went to Ecuador, and all these excuses, yada, yada, yada. So I went on a long run, my last long run before the half marathon next Sunday, and I finally got over like six miles. I haven't been able to do more than that. And I, I got to this point where I'm looking at the Queen Mary and I just finished running four and a half miles. And I'm like, all right, I gotta go back home. And I, I, was, I had a rough week and I was just sitting. I'm like, God, I wanna meet with you. And as soon as I said in my heart, God, I wanna meet with you, he's like, well, I'm right here. It was like, he was like, yep, I've been here the whole time. I had a little bit faster of a pace, but you're good. You can go at your little slow jog. He didn't say that. That's not his voice. But it was like this moment where it wasn't me like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get the, the candle lit. I gotta get the cigarettes music in the background. No, Bethel without words on in the Beth background. I got, the, the, I got my Bible out. I got my pour over coffee. Okay, here we go. It's 4.30 a.m. Conditions are good. I've confessed all the sin. All right, God, come, come on. Where are you at? Now he's just like, I'm always, I'm always with you. I'm always speaking. So learning to hear his voice and learning to discern his voice in your mind and heart. That's the key. That's where the money is. All of those other things are absolutely useful, but this is where it goes. Go to the next slide. Um, so 
how God speaks, he speaks through Jesus, creation, prophecy, dreams, and vision, angels, audible voices, circumstances, gut feelings, and sense, and directly into your heart and mind. How do we know if it's God speaking, right? How do we know if it's, if it's his voice versus our voice? This is what we have to learn, how to practice discernment and wisdom. In, in Hebrew, the word for discernment and wisdom are the same words. So we learn to um, practice understanding what his voice, so what are two key ways to learn discernment and wisdom? Well, number one is ask the question, does it line up with scripture? The Holy Spirit's not gonna speak to you something that's contradictory to scripture. Now, this is a real problem today because most of us, most of people in culture in our society believe that their feelings, what they think, which is really what they feel about something is the dominant authority in their life. But for followers of Jesus, it has to be scripture. We come under, we submit our lives to scripture. And so we have to ask the question with this, whatever we're trying to discern, whatever we're trying to, if God's speaking to us and, and moving us to another company or discerning whether or not to go do this thing or that thing, we have to ask the question, does this line up with scripture? Some things, it, it's gonna be a little more complicated. Like, do I take this job or that job? Well, what does scripture say? It's gonna be hard, you know? But, but there might be ways that you can use scripture to discern that. Um, but it's more about learning to discern whether or not it's his voice. The other one that is helpful for me is, does it sound like Jesus? Does it sound like Jesus? When, when you hear God's voice, does it sound like Jesus? You see, Jesus is relaxed, non-anxious, unhurried. And I feel like a lot of the times I'm meeting with people about discerning things for their life, there's an urgency. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like this, I have to know right now, otherwise this is opportunity is gonna pass. If that's the case, I don't know if it's from the Lord. Now that's not all cases, so I can't, I can't make it generally speaking, but it does, it does, does it sound like Jesus? Go to the next slide. All right, I just threw this in this morning. I was just praying, I'm like, you know what? Um, but I want to give you this. This is just, I, I feel like I, I, I have a lot of people ask me, how do I discern guidance for my life? Like, do I take this job? Do I leave this, this state and go to another state? And, or do I, do I, what do I do? And I, I have learned like how to practice wisdom. So here's discerning, this is separate, just a little side note. Can we just have a little uh, side discussion on this stuff? So discerning direction and making wise decisions. So here's some questions for you when you're discerning guidance, what to do with your life. What has the scripture been speaking to you about this? What has the Holy Spirit been saying to you about this? What has your covenantal community heard? Are they listening on behalf? Are they hearing on behalf of you? So if you have a decision to make in your life and you're, here, you're trying to discern God's voice, what does scripture say? What's the Holy Spirit been speaking to you? What has your community said about this? Have you brought them in? Do you have people that are listening on behalf? Does this move you from community or towards community? This is a big one. Most of us don't have covenantal relationships that we're committed to. We just allow our jobs to direct us or our, our, our ideas for life rather than the covenantal community. Um, does this align with your values? What are the pros and cons? Does this require more or less faith to move forward? And have there been any prophetic words, words of knowledge or words of wisdom within the community that you live in about this? What's the timeline? Are you, are you making this decision in a hurry because the offer is too good to be true? So I, I would say if you're trying to discern, these are some great question, questions to filter. What happens in a prophetic environment is we take the prophetic words and we make that the number one thing. But does this align with the other things going on in your life? You have to test it. Does that make sense? Go to the next slide. We don't have time to talk about that. I wanna get to... Okay, so reasons why we might not hear God's voice before we talk about how to grow. Here are some reasons why you might not hear God's voice. Number one, you have a distorted view of God. If you don't believe God is interested in your life, if you don't believe he's a loving father who's running after you, if you don't believe, if you believe he's like the absentee landlord, he's uninterested, he's a, a judging uh, or judgmental father who's waiting for you to screw up, He's a cosmic traffic cop. Your image of God, your view of God will shape what you hear from that God. So you have to realign your image of God to the scriptures. And let me just free you from that. The ultimate revelation of God is Jesus on the cross. This is what Paul says. This is the greatest picture of what God is like. 
Every other image of God has to come to this conclusion that God is self, self-sacrificing and all-inclusive loving. The, the stories that Jesus tells is he's like the running father, the father who takes after, who runs after the prodigal who's barely made it home. And before he can tell the excuses, he wraps his arms around his boy and says, my boy's home, kill the pig, we're gonna have a party. Kill the calf, not the pig. It was not a pig. <laughs> Just craving bacon all of a sudden. And now I have a vision of bacon. No. You gotta, uh, we're not prepared. We're not prepared. There's a quote, I think, um, from Dallas Willard. He says this. He says, our failure to hear God, uh, his voice when we want is due to the fact that we do not, in general, want to hear it that we want only when we think we need it. In other words, we only want God to speak to our life, speak into our life when we need his voice and direction on something. We're not regularly posturing ourselves in obedience to his voice. Um, the, uh, go back to that last slide. So other ways, so we're not prepared for it. We don't ask. We don't ask God to speak. We don't, we're not, li- like literally I was finally, I'm, I'm struggling all week long, struggling all week long. And then Saturday comes and I finally go on a run and it's after I run all this that I finally go, okay, God, would you, would you I wanna hear from you. Like it's taken me seven days to be humble enough to say, I can't figure this out on my own. I can't be healthy enough. I can't fast enough. I can't sleep enough. I can't do um, yoga or exercise. I can't get it right. I can't read and do devotion. What I need is to be saved, and I need a cross. And Jesus, are you here? Yeah, I'm right here, bud. Chill. <laughs> What's the deal? There's a cross, and you have to go through it. And I'm the one that did it. So just receive life. Stop striving. We, got, we, got, we're, we need to ask, and then we, need, we, we don't obey. What might hinder our ability to hear God's voice? We don't obey. There's sin in our life that's disabling our ability to hear God's voice. Um, sometimes we're like praying for a word from the Lord, we, like we want an answer, but there has been a word already spoken a few months ago about something and we haven't obeyed that yet. So God's like, no, I'm, I'm ready to give this to you, but you have to go over here. Like there was 13, uh, 15 months of like God speaking, spoken, and then me going, okay, where are you at? And then I'm like, oh yeah, wait, okay, I'm gonna go. Yes, that's right. I have to come way back here. And then it was like a flood of all this other stuff. So sometimes we have to learn to obey the words he's already spoken. Sometimes we have to learn to obey the word he already spoke. How we doing, church? Amen. Amen. Do you remember? Okay. Next, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna land with some real practicals. How do we grow in hearing God's voice? Number one, I want you to be open to hearing from God. Uh, This may seem like, duh, but actually it's not. You have to be open to a spiritual experience. So there are Christians that do not believe God speaks today, right? They're called cessationists, some of them, but some of them just don't believe God speaks to individuals, and I don't know how you can read the New Testament and believe that. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't God speaking to the prophets and the apostles, and then we can look throughout history. (laughs) Beyond, you know, the church history, we have the Wesleys, we have Dorothy Day, we have Mother Teresa, we have, we have Martin Luther, we have um, France, Francis of Assisi, we have the Benedict um, monastic movement, we have the Jesuits, Xavier, we have, we have people throughout history that have heard God's voice, obscure voice to do things, and they obeyed, and the results have been macro exponential impact. They're like a soil that's good, that produces a hundredfold. And they're ordinary people. All of them are extraordinarily ordinary. That's what makes it such an amazing story. Peter's real ordinary. To the end, he doesn't get Jesus. It's not until the Holy Spirit comes and he's like, all right, I got it, let's go. By the grace of God, we have people like Peter, people like Paul, people like Thomas, people like John Wesley, people like Charles Wesley, people like um, Francis of Assisi. All, All of these people were ordinary that just heard God's voice and obeyed. Some of them through reading scripture and obeying it. Some of them through a spiritual experience and obeying it. Some of them on a boat 
wondering how could the Moravians be so at peace when we're all gonna capsize? And John Wesley's like, I want what you have. What do you have? The Holy Spirit. And then he gets filled and then his ministry takes off. The Methodist movement amazing movement in, in American history. Within 75 years, only, there were only 13,000 Christians. Within 75 years, one third of the entire United States were Methodist. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. How are we doing, church? Ask for him to speak and spend time listening. Maybe I should say, ask for him to speak and spend time waiting. You wanna learn to hear God's voice ask and wait. Don't fill your prayer life with words. Don't fill your prayer life with thoughts. There are, there are moments for that, but if you want to hear his voice, you've got to learn to sit in his presence. So that's, and that's what I want us to become, a church that's presence-driven. And learning how to hear his voice is so much a part of that. Spend a lot of time in scripture and in prayer. Um, pay attention to your everyday life. I think the way, this is the biggest thing is I, I, don't, I don't, God will speak to you in your quiet time. God will speak to you in your, your home and your quiet space, but I think God speaks to us on the go most of the time because that's where most of our life is spent, on the go. And I think he's looking for followers that actually tune in on the go and learn to listen to his voice, learn to hear their belovedness when they're standing in line and start laughing for no, for no reason at all other than the fact that they know they're loved by God. Or to be going out in public going, I want to be useful. I want to hear on behalf of my brothers and sisters here. I want to go to, to a coffee shop and, and, and sit and be like, God, what are you up to? And be useful to sharing the words of the Lord in the moment. This is what we've got to be trained in. Be, pay attention to your everyday life. Obey when you do hear. When he speaks, when you finally think he might have said something, you might not, you're like, it's just a funny idea. It's just like this silly idea. I'm in, I'm in you know, on this train in India. He's like, hey, plant a church in Long Beach. There's a million excuses on why that does not make sense. I lived in Newport Beach. I was engaged. I'd never, I'd never preached publicly other than in classroom for a grade with Pastor Bill Doctrum. I've been working at a church for three months. It was a 6,000 person church. There's no reason a 22 year old white kid from Orange County should go to downtown Long Beach. This, at the time, the second most diverse church with a wife who had a heart condition that was undiagnosed or with funding that was only gonna be lasting 10 months and that was it. It doesn't make sense that 30 year olds and 40 year olds were coming to our church hearing a 22 year old preach for 15 minutes and it took him 20 hours to give those 15 minutes. It doesn't make sense unless God's doing something, unless he said it, unless that obscure idea, that thought that could just be a thought actually was God's voice that became a, a move for this family and it became a calling for other people and it became a church because God speaks and worlds are created. created. Now let me say something because I want to just answer the Yelp review. How, what does it mean for us to, speak words and worlds to be created. I don't mean literal worlds are created. Come on, that's, that's not, I mean when we speak words of affirmation to people, new worlds are created inside their heart and mind. When you speak affirming thoughts over people, when, they, when Michael preached and we're saying, you are a preacher, Michael, his world is opened up. When you, when you speak the word of the Lord to other people, when you use words to build, to strengthen worlds, identities are created that look a little better than they were before. That's what I mean. Prophetic practice. I want to give all of you this one tool. I was talking to a, a leader of a church um, and he has this incredible movement of prophetic ministry. Their entire church is prophetic. And I was, he's a friend and he's got this international ministry and I was like, how do I get a prophetic ministry like this at the garden? What do I have to do? What are the meetings? What, I'm just talking strategy. And he's like, here's what you're gonna do. All right, you ready? And then after this, after you get this down, then we'll talk about the next thing. All right, what do I do? He's like, Darren, when you go home next, I want you to go at dinner. I want you to tell your family, your, your two boys, who, my, I have two boys, five and two, and your wife and say, hey, if Jesus walked into the room, what would he say to mommy? So that we did. This is, and he's like, don't do anything else. Don't try to build a prophet gathering. Don't try to gather the prophets. Don't try, to, don't try to teach on prophecy right away. I want you to allow this to become culture of your life. So I said, all right, guys, this is what we're gonna do. If uh, Jesus walks into the room, what would he say to mommy? And Ezra, without missing a beat, says, what does he say? Mom, um, you're the best mommy for these boys. 
like a five-year-old. And then what's great is because we've been doing it at night, Amos, who's two, we were going to bed. He like interrupted us in babbling, broken two-year-old toddler language. It was like, Jesus say? What would Jesus say? He was reminding us to do this practice. I want to create this, like in our kids' ministry, we could put a kid in the middle and say, kids, if Jesus walked in, what would he say to Charlotte right now? And this is a safe way to practice perfect. What would he say? Does it sound like him? Oh, God loves you so much. You're an incredible seven. You're like, just think about the type of prophetic ministry that we could build. It's not very, it's not like, okay, let's wait on the Holy Spirit. Here he comes. Okay, close your eyes, open up your hands. Now, you could literally go to Starbucks and say in your own head, if Jesus walks into the room, what would you want to say to that cashier? 